I mean, great. <laughs> Teach people to make their beds by all means, but then don't stray into the area of saying that the way to be a real man is to hold a woman against the wall by her throat. It's not that complicated, but people mm-hmm. act as if it is. I think if we were talking about another kind of extremism, we wouldn't be so quick to excuse people for really extreme things that they say because they also once said something innocuous. It's kind of a bit of a weird double standard. But it's important, really, I think, to contextualise Andrew Tate as one part of a much bigger online context. And the mainstream media has kind of plucked him out and held him up as if he is this kind of completely um, unprecedented figure, as if he's this sort of Svengali Pied Piper figure who has charmed boys with this completely brand new narrative. Mm. And it gives him this power and it plays into his kind of martyr complex when the reality is that he's just one piece of a much, much bigger puzzle. And actually, the mainstream media has played a really big role in platforming him and giving him this status and this notoriety and this sense of kind of importance and power. You've spent the last decade researching misogyny online. You've been spending a lot of time deep in forums that I would say aren't really safe for anyone to go in, but you've apparently, well, I don't know, have you enjoyed your time there? (laughs) No, (laughs) I don't think anybody (laughs) would really. What would you say (laughs) sexism looks like online? I think it looks different from people's perception. I think part of the problem is that we have a kind of societal perception that when we talk about these issues online, it's people being a bit kind of squeamish. It's, oh, we don't like it when people say a sexist joke or they disagree with us. And it's really hard to communicate people that what you're actually talking about is communities of tens of thousands of men that are really actively inciting not just hatred and extreme misogyny, but offline violence. So they are forums which are actively focused on trying to egg up and persuade people to go offline and rape women, murder women, assault women. And I think that's quite hard for the general public to really grasp because it sounds so extreme. It also sounds like quite hyperbolized, doesn't it? Because I suppose it's if you're not used to these sort of forums, you're not used to kind of like 4chan, 8chan, you wouldn't you wouldn't think they exist i mean yeah where where do you think where do people go or how do people find themselves in these enclaves so i think that people tend to get sucked into it quite gradually it's quite a slippery slope and there are really clever methods being used to draw people in without them kind of realizing what's going on so i think again there's this there's this misconception that you know teenagers must be going online and typing in i hate women and you know it's not like that at all mm. i think a lot of young boys who end up drawn into these forums don't necessarily go looking for them in the first place it starts out with a viral youtube video or it starts out with a clip that they see on tiktok or it even starts out in a gaming live stream or a bodybuilding forum and then it's quite a gradual process of kind of just wider kind of normalized misogyny and racism within the online spaces that young people are often inhabiting and then gradually gradually a kind of slippery slope of its irony and its banter and it's sarcastic and we don't really mean it and then at a certain point you reach a place where actually it isn't a joke anymore but you couldn't really put your finger on where that happened and for a lot of people they won't necessarily end up in the more extreme forums but they'll still come into contact with some of that ideology kind of downstream and then it becomes normalized absolutely so then it becomes normalized and it becomes really common i work in about two schools a week all over the country so i work with tens of thousands of young people every year and over the last maybe five years it's become increasingly common to hear really young kids of maybe 12 or 13 repeating misconceptions repeating conspiracy theories that you know that they've heard in these online spaces like the gender pay gap is a myth me too is a witch hunt against men women are lying about rape all the time the vast majority of victims of domestic abuse are men men everywhere are losing their jobs white men are the real oppressed minority all of these kind of ideas that have their origins in some of these more extreme online communities, but they're kind of seeping out very effectively into our wider society. I think I've had a lot of panelists sort of on the other side of this argument say that this is just men reclaiming themselves. Do you think it goes further than that? Is I mean, is it dangerous, really? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just important to kind of describe it accurately for what it is. These are not spaces that are supportive and nurturing and kind for men. This is not a case of kind of attacking a space where men are going to find solidarity and support each other, which is how it's sometimes portray- portrayed in the mainstream media. There's this sense of, oh, there's a couple of extreme outliers on there and you're using them as an excuse to try and shut down spaces that are all about poor men supporting each other. These spaces aren't positive 
active or supportive for men, they're completely toxic. They're spaces where men are really eviscerated cruelly by other men. They lambast each other. They're horrible about each other's appearance and prospects. And they repeatedly really, really try and encourage each other to commit suicide. So, yeah, there are great support groups for men in this country. There's things like Andy's Man Club. There's stuff like the Campaign Against Living Miserably. This isn't that. Criticizing this is not about trying to take away some brilliant support space for men. This is a space that really exploits men and drives them deeper into a kind of spiral of depression. And that's very much something that the men I've spoken to who've kind of come out of these communities have said that they feel as well. So you'd say it was different, say, from the sort of chat that goes on at the local boxing club? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, well, a really good example is that the CCDH, the Centre for Countering Digital Hate, recently did a study where they found, I think, every 30 seconds that rape is mentioned in an incel group. These aren't harmless groups that are about supporting men. They are actively and explicitly extremist misogynist groups. They are groups that are focused specifically on hatred of women, on dehumanising women, and on actively inciting offline violence against them. And in any other context, we would describe that as extremism. And when men who've been immersed in these groups come offline and commit acts of mass violence, like Elliot Roger, like Alec Manassian, even like Jake Davison in Plymouth more recently, we would describe that as terrorism. If somebody had been in an online group where they had been really groomed and radicalized into hatred of a specific demographic in this case that demographic is women and then they've gone offline and incited by those online groups they committed an act of mass violence to further that ideology to create fear in that group we would describe that as terrorism it meets every international definition but we don't describe this as extremism we don't describe the exploitation of vulnerable young men into these groups as grooming or radicalization even though it's exactly the same thing so why do you think that is do you think it's because many people don't understand it they don't understand the mechanisms or do you think that there's sort of maybe something more sinister to it I think it's partly that there's a lack of awareness of just how extreme these communities are and just how big they are but it's also about I think the convergence of two societal blind spots. First of all, there's the blind spot, the racist blind spot, where we find it really hard as a society to conceive of white men as terrorists. And we see that with white supremacists as well. We're far less likely to see them covered and described in that way in the media. Mm. And the other blind spot is that we find it hard to conceive of misogyny as extreme because it is so normalised in our society because one woman is murdered by a man every three days on average. And so we find it hard to think of this as something extreme, as something out of the ordinary. And I suppose, so going back to when you were talking about the pathways of like how people get into it. So, um, I mean, I know friends who have boyfriends who are bodybuilders, right? Completely mm, innocent bodybuilders, yeah. but they look for that content online, Instagram and other social medias, keep serving it to them. Mm-hmm. And then they find maybe like one in five, one in 10 videos starts to be something, well, deeply misogynistic yeah. or deeply hateful. You know, what sort of avenues are you being pushed through? So again, of course, there will be men who wouldn't, you know, in any way be affected by that content. There will be men who are bodybuilders who don't have anything to do with this. And that's important to say, it's nuanced. But I think particularly for much younger men, the algorithms know that if you are already a person who is kind of predisposed to perhaps anxiety or vulnerability around those societal stereotypes of a particular kind of macho, powerful masculinity, then it's kind of a kind of target group that they are already sort of seeing as as ripe for the picking for these kinds of messages about hyper toxic ideas of masculinity meaning violence meaning control over women and so on so a good example of this uh, bodybuilding forum I was in where there was a 14 year old boy and he'd written a really sweet comment about there being a girl in his class that he liked and he didn't know how to talk to her and the first comment was from a much older man and it just said rape it and it was a link to a pick up artist forum so it's not necessarily you know straight from one place to another it might be something that happens gradually over time and people will exploit and target those who seem more vulnerable to these kinds of ideas based on how they respond to the kind of more sort of innocuous seeming sexist jokes and memes and cultural touch points if you like Mm. and they also see it as a real gateway to white supremacy so white supremacists and neo-nazis have explicitly written online that they see anti-feminism as a gateway an easy way in to pull young men in and then to kind of take them down this slippery slope down this pathway they see misogyny as a kind of easier sell at the beginning 
beginning than racism. They think it's easier to dress it up in irony and banter. And then they are explicitly using this as a way to recruit young men into the far right, into white supremacy. And you can see that in the kind of figureheads of these movements. You can see it in the fact that the Proud Boys, for example, started out as an anti-feminist group. You can see it in individuals like Mike Cernovich or Milo Yiannopoulos, who made their name in the kind of Gamergate anti-feminist heyday and have gone on to become vocal members of what you would call the alt-right or the far right. And you can see it as well in the kind of language that trickles through. So some of the language that you see used in white supremacist sites or the far right is also very much kind of reminiscent of incel language. And then where does Andrew Tate fit into all of this then? How does that kind of come about? Because I suppose it's the, what you read most is, you know, I like Andrew Tate because he encourages me to, you know, be a better man. And it's kind of the same narrative that was used with Jordan Peterson. Yeah. Like he just encouraged me to make my bed. Yeah. At what point do those figures become dangerous? Well, obviously no one's saying it's a problem to tell people to make their bed. Um, but what I find interesting... What if they've done it badly? <laughs> I mean, great. <laughs> Teach people to make their beds by all means, but then don't stray into the area of saying that the way to be a real man is to hold a woman against the wall by her throat. It's not that complicated, but people mm -hmm. act as if it is. I think if we were talking about another kind of extremism, we wouldn't be so quick to excuse people for really extreme things that they say because they also once said something innocuous. It's kind of a bit of a weird double standard. But it's important, really, I think, to contextualise Andrew Tate as one part of a much bigger online context. And the mainstream media has kind of plucked him out and held him up as if he is this kind of completely um, unprecedented figure, as if he's this sort of Svengali Pied Piper figure who has charmed boys with this completely brand new narrative. Mm. And it gives him this power and it plays into his kind of martyr complex, when the reality is that he's just one piece of a much, much bigger puzzle. And actually, the mainstream media has played a really big role in platforming him and giving him this status and this notoriety and this sense of kind Kind of importance and power but so have algorithms as well we know that online algorithms are um, meant to drive people and young people in particular towards increasingly extreme content because that's what keeps them watching so they're not designed to serve up the best quality videos or um, the most relevant to your search criteria but just increasingly extreme stuff and that means that people are more likely to keep watching for longer and that means that when you're talking about anything that has to do with women or anything to do with sex or anything like that you are likely to start getting videos presented to you with figures like Andrew Tate and then increasingly extreme uh, views. So how do you go about tackling then the vulnerabilities in men mm -hmm. that attract them to not Andrew Tate but the Andrew Tate paradigm say? Well, if we look at what young people say that they get out of these communities, it's a feeling of a cause, it's a feeling of belonging, it's a feeling of community, it's a sense of being part of something. And those are all exact descriptors of what young guys used to get out of youth clubs. And I don't think it's a coincidence that we've seen provision for youth clubs absolutely slashed. So many of them have closed their doors in the last decade. If we look at funding for the mental health system, particularly for teenagers, for young men, it's completely crumbling. We know that by the time that you reach university, fewer than a third of the counselling services offered by universities are accessed by male students. So there are a lot of real pressures and issues facing young men, a lot of them about public funding and infrastructure that we could absolutely be tackling in a positive way. There's so much we could be doing to support young men. But it's important that we don't set this up as a kind of victim narrative that we say because of all that, it's completely understandable that men have started talking about raping and murdering women and egging each yeah. other on to do it, right? <laughs> yeah, sorry, that's almost laughable, isn't it? Because it's so obvious. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Um, you work a lot in schools, don't you? I yeah. mean, what kind of, you know, what sort of things from the internet or from these forums have you seen in classrooms? So for a really long time, long before Andrew Tate was on our screens or kind of being talked about on the nightly news, kids have been coming out with, I think, things that are really worrying, particularly from online porn. So ideas about what sex looks like, ideas about what kind of mixed gender relationships look like that we would consider really extreme and troubling, but that they report completely kind of factually as if, well, that's just what sex is. And it's a really clear disconnect between what the online world of online porn is telling them sex is and kind of reality. So for example, really common for kids to say things like, it's not rape if she enjoys it. Rape is a compliment really. Um, crying is part of foreplay. Uh, he can't rape you if he's your boyfriend. 
Um, a example would be a school I went into where they'd had a rape case involving a 14-year-old boy and a teacher had said to him, why didn't you stop when she was crying? And he'd said, because it's normal for girls to cry during sex. And that's a really common thing to come across. Um, there was a 13-year-old girl who wrote to me and said, I'm so scared to have sex because a boy showed me a video of it on a mobile phone at school. And until then, I didn't know that when you have sex, the woman has to be hurting and crying. Oh, my God. And these aren't kind of just isolated anecdotes. There was some research from Durham University recently that found that an eighth of the first-hand videos that are first served up to users of the most mainstream, easily accessible porn websites, front page, first time users one eighth of them show women being raped coerced or otherwise illegal acts and there was a really powerful report from the children's commissioner that just came out a couple of months ago and it found that not only are kids accessing porn much younger than we might realize but by the time they leave their teens 80 percent of young people have seen porn that shows sexual violence so there is this really mistaken notion these misconceptions being created in online porn about what sex is and that's really scary for guys as well. We had, I remember one story on the Everyday Sexism Project from a young woman. She'd had sex with her boyfriend at university for the first time. And he'd started trying to choke and throttle her halfway through without any warning, which is something, again, we're hearing lots of increasing reports of that. She panicked. She managed to push him off. And he broke down in tears and said, I'm so, so sorry. I just thought that was what you would be expecting because right. that's what he's seen online. And that's terrifying for guys as well, right? This is what is gonna be expected of you to be a real man, this is what you have to do. I mean, how do you, not that I'm gonna ask you to solve it. I mean, how do you even begin to solve that though? Because I mean, it, it, it's just, it, it's, have you got any thoughts? Cause I don't <laughs> even know how to phrase the question. I mean, how do you go about <laughs> stopping to serve that sort of content to someone, you know? How, how does that happen? Yeah, I mean, I think there is definitely a kind of whole road to go down in terms of trying to regulate, but I also think that successive governments have focused on the wrong thing. So they've focused on this idea of stopping kids from seeing porn mm. under Cameron's government particularly, instead of saying, actually, let's empower them. Let's talk to them about it. Let's educate them and give them really high quality sex education so that when they see that it doesn't necessarily have the same effect the problem isn't just porn it's porn in a vacuum that's what makes it dangerous when there's no other messaging going on to contradict those ideas or to empower kids to say yeah but there are other ways to have a relationship to have sex for pleasure to come into the equation and so what we need is education from a much younger age education that looks at gender stereotypes and consent and respectful relationships from the age of three or four and of course that doesn't mean talking to four-year-olds about porn because everybody goes oh, oh my mm. god but you know when we teach a three-year-old going into nursery you don't hit another kid no one goes oh my god you can't talk to them about violence mm -hmm, right so in the same way we can teach kids from that age this is your body and you get to make choices about your body we can do it in really simple ways like when a child comes into school in the morning and the teacher gives them a choice do they want to shake hands or hug or high five or wave hello today that is a way to teach kids consent and bodily autonomy from the age of three in a completely age-appropriate way we can do so much more of that, but we're not at the moment. So you get this bizarre scenario where kids are 15 or 16 and all they know about sex and relationships is coming from online porn. And that's when it becomes really damaging that online porn is so misogynistic. But then you can kind of already hear the tabloid alarm bells ringing. Yeah. Even talking about different ways to, you yeah. know, present yourself or how you would like to, you know, yeah. how you would like to consent. That's already like a big, I can see it, a front page already. Yeah. I mean, why do... Why do kind of right wingers get so alarmed by this? Because you would have thought it's so entwined with anything to do with assault or anything to do with, you know, underage yeah. children. You'd think you'd be a proponent of that. You would think, wouldn't you? I mean, at the moment, we are in the middle of a massive and completely disingenuous backlash against sex and relationships education that is being driven by this, again, completely disingenuous cry of like, think of the children, protect the children. But all the statistics we have show that really high quality age appropriate relationships and sex education is protective. It lowers teen pregnancies, it raises the age at which young people first have sex, but really crucially it lets young people know what their rights are. The number of women that have written to the Everyday Sexism Project that I've worked with firsthand 
who have been assaulted or raped and don't even know that that is what it was because it was so, so normal. It's so high. We've got young people who are being abused, whether it's at home or outside of school. Sadly, child sexual exploitation is really high. So having a message in school that lets people know what's not normal and what their rights are and that help is available and that this isn't shameful and that they can talk about it and that something that's done to them isn't their fault. These are messages that kids don't just need, they deserve them. It's a human right and it's, mm. it's awful that people are trying to take that away from them. How much would you say um, the issue with porn and what porn children are watching has been exacerbated by the pandemic? I think it's a complex picture um, and it's sort of at the point of speculation here. I don't think that we have really, really good stats available mm. or research available on this yet. But I think what we can say with confidence is that the pandemic has driven more young people online in greater numbers and for greater periods of time and probably with less supervision through absolutely no fault of parents and teachers who were desperately doing their best in a completely unprecedented situation. But again, I think the solution to that isn't so much to panic about kids being online and to panic about trying to kind of shut stuff down. It's about opening up other spaces. It's about opening up spaces for discussion, both in our homes, with parents, and in schools, where they can express their fears and anxieties. They can talk about things they've seen and what's worried them. And the more that we don't do that, the more we give power to what they're seeing online. And the same goes for all of the stuff we've been talking about, really, with kind of extreme misogyny online, because it's preying on fear, really. And if we have a chance to talk about that stuff, then we can debunk it. A guy in the UK is 230 times more likely to be raped himself than falsely accused of rape. But we've got these online guys claiming to care about men and their rights and their problems, whipping men up into a panic about false rape allegations. So let's talk about that stuff. Let's talk about what's underpinning that. And then let's actually talk about what problems men are facing. Because we know that men who are raped, who experience child sexual abuse, don't always feel able to come forward or get help because of those exact same macho gender stereotypes about men being tough and manly and boys not crying so a lot of these online figures who claim to be standing for men and kind of supporting boys they're actually doubling down on exactly the stereotypes that we know are hurting and, and killing men and boys that's so interesting i mean the number of times probably even just in the last week i've heard segments on national news outlets about men being falsely accused yeah i mean in proportion to that this sorry statistic you've just put down there it's just absolutely extraordinary yeah, and how often do we talk about that male victims of sexual violence mm. so rarely if these guys online actually cared about men they'd be doing 230 times as many videos about men who've been raped as they would about false allegations we know that false allegations are vanishingly rare we've got really clear statistics from the cps about how rare they are they're no more common than for any other kind of crime and yet we don't hear people going around kind of of panicking and having repeated news articles about you know false allegations of, of arson or whatever it is we treat it differently from any other crime imagine a victim of arson in court finding that police have gone through their phone and suddenly they're confronted with a facebook post from two years ago that says you did once go to a bonfire so actually we think you might have quite yeah. enjoyed this it's madness but we're so used to it that we don't see how crazy it is so then how much effect do you think that the long-awaited online safety bill will have on all of this? So the online safety bill is over 250 pages long and it doesn't mention women once. And I think that kind of answers your question. If we don't acknowledge that this is a gendered issue, that it is disproportionately impacting women and girls, then we can't even start to fix it. Kind of similar to in policing, how can we even begin to tackle institutional misogyny in a force that's saying, absolutely, these are bad apples. No one could have seen these guys coming. This guy who raped and murdered someone, complete shock out of the blue. And then it turns out that he was nicknamed the rapist by his colleagues and had been reported for indecent exposure three times and nothing had been done. If we can't name a problem, we can't solve a problem. But the argument there would be that you can at least vet who goes into a police force, right? You can't vet who will go onto the internet, can you? Mm -hmm. No, but what we can do is hold platforms that they operate on online accountable 
eligible for actually looking at the safety of their users. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, that's something that we don't really do. But what we need to look at is real regulation. These are platforms that already have terms of use and service that they claim that, you know, misogyny and other forms of abuse won't be allowed. And yet you've got Andrew Tate's content pumped out to 11.4 billion views on TikTok, even though it completely contravenes their own user guidelines. Mm. So it's about holding these platforms accountable for what they claim to have set as their own standards. I always find the algorithm around Andrew Tate so fascinating because I have never been organically served a piece mm -hmm. of Andrew Tate content. And even when I've gone and actively searched for it, yeah. it's then never been served back to me. Yeah. It's that the algorithm is just so extraordinarily powerful. You'd think <laughs> you'd be able to sort of wipe out these avenues if you're able yeah. to serve them. And it's extraordinarily offensive to the vast majority of men as well. Mm. It was so offensive to men when Andrew Tate tweeted after he'd been charged with rape, human trafficking and starting an organised crime group to sexually exploit women. His first tweet was it was something like, uh, men, this isn't just about me, this is about all of us. Today it's me, tomorrow it will be you. And you just think how incredibly <laughs> offensive to all men to suggest that they're all at risk of being accused of human trafficking and sexual, yeah. sexual exploitation when they haven't all got websites where they've explicitly previously written that that was basically their job and what they did. They're not all going around making videos saying, boom, bang out the machete and grip her against the wall by her neck like that's you mate giving men a bad name and the idea that all guys are part of that and on board with that and it's the same with the algorithm if you set up an account as a teenage boy and you start a new account it will immediately start serving you that stuff and the thing is so many teenage boys are better than that you know it's a complex picture i'm seeing kids in schools who've definitely been radicalized and exposed to this content but i'm also meeting teenage boys who are fed up with it teenage boys who don't want to be identified with that who want to be part of changing the world and doing things differently and we're seeing so many male role models who are presenting these new ways of being a man we've got guys like marcus rashford we've got andy murray we've got jordan stevens we've got obama and daniel radcliffe there's an endless list of men who are speaking out about different forms of masculinity and yet the media narrative continues to be Andrew Tate is in a vacuum there's no other role models for men and that's why guys are gravitating towards him that's nonsense it's just that he's the guy that you are choosing to platform and create this fanfare around and he's also the person that the algorithms are pushing out to young men so on the online safety bill being created in um, the houses of parliament yeah. which is quite well known for several instances of sexual misconduct. I mean, what's what's yeah. your takeaway from all of the allegations that have been levied at the, 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 you know, the infamous Westminster bubble? I think this is the other problem. Like, how can we be trusting politicians to be tackling these problems in a meaningful way when we know that there are guys watching porn in Parliament? Or we know that 56 of our currently sitting MPs, 56 out of 650, it's almost 10% are themselves under investigation for sexual misconduct. Mm. There hasn't been any transparency about that process. There hasn't been any updates since those figures came out, which means that these men are still making laws that affect our lives. They're still meeting with vulnerable constituents. How can we have any faith that that is a group of people, only 30% of them are women, of course, who are qualified and um, motivated to be tackling these issues? It's, I think it's a real problem. That extraordinary revelation from Charlotte Nichols a few months ago that when she first entered Parliament, she was given a list of names of people to avoid. Mm -hmm. I mean, what kind of workplace has that? I don't know about you. I've never worked in an office where that sort of thing has been offered. Well, I think, unfortunately, of course, because I run the Everyday Sexism Project, I mm. hear a lot of these stories. And unfortunately, I think it is still a relatively common thing. I think that workplace sexual harassment and assault are still yeah. far more common than people would like to acknowledge. We know from a big piece of research we did with the TUC, for example, that two thirds of young women and over half of all women still experience sexual harassment at work, even now. Um, but I think what's particularly troubling about Westminster, of course, is that we should be holding them to an even higher standard. We should be expecting them to be leading the way and the reality is that if you look at sitting hours if you look at the kind of treatment of people with caring responsibilities if you look at maternity provision if you look at parental leave it absolutely is archaic it isn't leading the way at all mm. yeah definitely i mean the the bar culture that exists in westminster mm -hmm. is absolutely extraordinary i mean if you've got a late vote going on that bar will be open sometimes till midnight yeah. one two o'clock in the morning i mean there's been a lot of talk about you could solve the misogyny uh, problem mm -hmm. in Parliament if you just got rid of 
the bars. I mean, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's uh, putting too much blame on the alcohol and not enough on the individuals. Mm-hmm. I think we're talking about a deeply misogynistic culture. It's a male dominated culture. It's one in which women aren't fairly represented. It's archaic, it's old fashioned, but it's also again propped up by other institutions. So this is the problem. It's not just that you've got guys in parliament accusing one of our most senior opposition female MPs of crossing and uncrossing her legs to distract the prime minister. It's that that is then legitimized and amplified by our mainstream media doing double page stories on it comparing her to Sharon Stone in Basic Instinct so all of these institutions policing, politics, education criminal justice, they are all institutionally misogynistic and they are all institutionally linked Um, and, and that's what I wrote about in Fix the System Not the Women which is my recent book, it's about looking at how we tackle these institutional issues instead of continuing to blame individual women as if they are the problem when really we're looking at an entire system mm, and if they're not overly sexualized and they're pushed out of the conversation altogether through what things like childcare, because yeah. there's not adequate pr- provisions which means that women physically can't be in the room absolutely and that's something that we've really seen if we think about women like Stella Creasy or Tulip Sadiq who both ended up struggling into parliament heavily pregnant to vote one of them with gestational diabetes one of them actually postponing her c-section that had been planned because there wasn't any provision in place otherwise for how they could do that that's really a workplace that has an issue and then we expect to look to them to set the tone for the rest of the country you can see why we're in such a mess and then as you said there's like you know mechanisms that are in place that are working in tangent so i mean when stella creasy took her baby into Mm -hmm. the chamber there were what how many op-eds were written after that exactly so again you've got the press kind of legitimizing and amplifying that misogyny and it's a vicious circle and of course we've got the most uh, expensive childcare system in the developed world which again should be a source of national shame and scandal it should be a source of absolute national scandal and embarrassment that one rape per day of the school term on average is reported to police from inside uk schools or that almost a third of teenage girls say they experience sexual assault unwanted sexual touching at school but these are facts that we accept as part of the national fabric they are things that we simply accept as just the way things are. How do you think that this conversation about abortion fits into all of this? I mean, the last couple of weeks, well, probably about a month ago now, there was the National Conservative Forum, and Mm. that was a big, you know, show of evangelical American ideas that I I suppose we haven't actually experienced in Britain for quite some time, well, definitely not on the mainstream. Yeah. I mean, how do you think the kind of curtailment on abortion or opening up the discussion is affecting misogyny i think again it normalizes misogyny by legitimizing it it normalizes misogyny because it's written into law because our current incredibly outdated laws on abortion that have recently seen a woman jailed of course are so outdated so out of step with modern times that they infantilize women and dehumanize women even now and but that hasn't been seen as a priority nobody's thought we actually need to bother about rewriting that it doesn't really matter we'll just carry on is a classic example of the way that we treat women and the way that misogyny is normalized